For most of you who do not know me, my name is Lee. I'm a family doctor uh, practicing in Southwest Florida since 2002. And in 2009, we had an epiphany uh, of how to run a better practice. Uh, and in 2009, we started building a, a business model. And in 2010, my partner, Dr. Bill Crouch, and I threw a hand grenade into a fully developed uh, and mature and fully functioning insurance-based primary care practice and started something brand new and developed in 2010 what turned out in hindsight to be one of the country's early direct primary care practices. So um, in 2011, I was invited to give a presentation to the board of the Florida Medical Association to talk to them about what it was that I was doing uh, in, within their state. And I'm sharing with them a story about a patient of mine that comes in uh, that had basal cell cancer on his arm. And this patient had no insurance, so the patient went to the dermatologist, and the dermatologist's practice said, well, that's $5,000 to do Mohs surgery payable up front if you'd like to have that basal cell cancer treated. I had already biopsied it in my office, so we knew the diagnosis. So the patient comes back to me and says, doc, I guess I'm just going to die of cancer. And I said, no, why don't you come on into the next room? And I go ahead and went ahead and just did a wide excision of the basal cell cancer there, sent it off to the pathologist, charged the patient $35 to give to the pathologist, to tell us that we got the margins and the margins were clear. So I'm telling this story to the board of the Florida Medical Association and I can see one person back there, face getting beat red. And when I was finished, um, it turned out he was a plastic surgeon and he was pissed. <laughs> uh, and he said, if you continue to tell this story, you're going to destabilize the entire healthcare industry. So that story has nothing to do with my talk, but I tell it everywhere I go. Um, so it's been a decade since I first uh, took this stage here, and it's, it's a privilege to be back here again. Um, in that 10 years since I first stepped out here, uh, through the work of Docs for Patient Care Foundation, of which I am the volunteer president of, we've had 1,500 physicians come through our direct primary care nuts and bolts training program. Many of the physicians in this room have been faculty in that, and so I can't thank you all enough for helping train the next generation of direct primary care doctors. But to put that in perspective, that is equivalent to 250 primary care family medicine residency classes. That's how many physicians we have trained uh, in the direct primary care model. So we're excited to see the model continue to go and, and to, to propagate. So this was my life before I, I threw the hand grenade in my practice. You know, so Epiphany is a strange name. That is the name of my practice is Epiphany Health. Epiphany is a very strange name for a healthcare company, but the Epiphany was why are we insuring primary care? Why are we putting so many obstacles and barriers between doctors and patients? And then we get disappointed that it's so cumbersome, so confusing. Filing a claim for every single touch between a doctor and a patient is absurd. So uh, insurance basically makes primary care complicated. Insurance makes something that's simple, very complex. That last picture was a toothbrushing machine by Rube Goldberg. But when we strip out all the noise, we get a very simple relationship between the doctor and the patient, which many of us have been talking about. So. Again, 10 years ago when I was on the stage, I would spend 30 minutes just to explain the concept of direct primary care, whereas almost every speaker yesterday were, were singing the praises of direct primary care and incorporating it into it. Today, I'd like to sort of share a little bit of story background and some of the data now that we have over a decade of, of, of doing this. So our price is $85 a month for adults, $30 a month for one child, and $15 a month for each additional child. After that, we do not charge anything for any service in our office. No copays, no deductibles. We don't file claims. We don't work with, with uh, any insurance companies whatsoever. We are opted out of Medicare. And so I show this slide for two particular reasons. Number one, the first time I gave this presentation to a group, it was 2012 nationally. It was in Washington, D.C. It was a group of doctors. And when I finished the presentation, a doctor raised his hand and said, well, you're charging $83 a month, which we were charging at the time. He said, what happens if a doctor sets up to you and charges $40 a month? And so my response was, that's an excellent question, but if the first question out of the audience is, what are we going to do when we bring down the cost of health care? We must have struck a nerve because nobody has ever asked that question in the United States before. But I said, we're going to have to compete on price and quality, and we're going to have to compete on price and quality as determined by the consumer of those services, which is the patient. And either I'm going to have to provide a better service or some measurable value to that patient to justify my prices, or I'm going to have to lower them or I'm going to lose them to the doctor down the street. And we will then determine what is an appropriate and fair price uh, for that service. So the second reason I show you this slide is this is the price of our service 
in the entire time that we have been open. And basically we are still charging the same price that we were 14 years ago. Uh, and in fact, the patients that signed up for our practice on day number one are paying to the penny exactly the same 14 years later. That's the skyrocketing cost of healthcare, by the way. You know, we all heard the skyrocketing cost of healthcare. So what we did was when we flipped the switch on this practice, we saw uninsured patients come to us from all over the state of Florida. We suddenly had a problem where we had to find affordable access to labs, affordable access to imaging services, physical therapy, special specialists. It forced us to create a cash-based network uh, of, of services. And it turns out in almost every case, uh, the prices we were getting were cheaper than the co-pays for the patients with insurance, uh, which was mind-blowing to me. So I show this picture, this is an actual hospital bill of a patient of mine. If you've seen my presentations, you've seen this slide for a long time. So if you know the answer, don't shout it out if you... So this patient went to the, uh, went to the emergency room for abdominal pain. Now, because I have access, because I'm not chasing all these dollar signs of coding and billing and prior authorizations and step edits, and, and I'm getting chest pains just thinking about it, um, I have more time to get people into the office real time. I can see them, I can do stat labs, I can do stat imaging. So. If we take that bill and we itemize it down, that hospital charged $20,000 for this ER visit. So if instead of that patient going to the emergency room, if they used our cash prices that we got, our cash CT scans, our cash labs, uh, our, all of our cash services, this is a very educated room on what prices should be. What could that price be? Just throw out a number, just shout it out. $2,000. Our patients pay $301.29 for those same services. So this is not pie in the sky. These are actual prices. This is what our patients actually pay. Okay. These are not made up figures. This is not a hypothetical. Now I do not run an intensive care unit. I am not staffing a 24 hour emergency room. I don't have an entire team of contract nurses and, 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 and labor that I'm paying for, but this is what it could cost. Okay. By the way, I gave this talk in South Carolina a few months ago. Uh, and the, the, the person that came up right after me was the vice president of, of Blue Cross of South Carolina. And, he, and it wasn't really fair, but he came up after me and he kept mentioning my name and talking about well, what Dr. Gross did and what Dr. Gross did. And Keith Smith was sitting next to me. He leaned over. He goes, if he mentions your name one more time, I think you're on his board. <laughs> so uh, the, the doctor in the upper left-hand corner is Dr. Elena George. She's an ear, ear, nose, and throat surgeon in Atlanta, Georgia, who does mission work down in Antigua, down in the Caribbean. And she went down there and she diagnosed a patient with thyroid cancer. This patient had no health insurance. And so when you're in the Caribbean, you get your health care done in San Juan. Uh, San Juan quoted a thyroidectomy of $100,000 for this patient. So Elena contacted Keith Smith uh, and Keith said, well, yeah, we can do the thyroid surgery, but this patient's going to need at least six months of medical management. They're going to need a workup. They're going to need staging. They're going to need blood work. They're going to need medicines, at least six months of medical management. He picked up the phone, called me and said, hey, Lee, Florida is a hell of a lot closer to Caribbean, then Oklahoma City, you want to co-manage this patient. And we did. Patient flew to Florida. Uh, we did the workup. We did the imaging. We did everything. Coordinated with Surgery Center of Oklahoma. Patient flew to Oklahoma City, had stellar care, uh, had a wonderful thyroidectomy surgery, flew back to Florida. We did all the post-operative management, six months of care. And the total cost for that entire thing was $10,000. So at $100,000, the story is I'm going to die of thyroid cancer. At $10,000, it's why am I buying insurance to, to cover this once-in-a-lifetime event that could be covered through a bake sale, um, borrowing money from friends. Um, you know, it, it makes you question the viability of some other non-insurance-based products when your once-in-a-lifetime catastrophic event can be managed for, you know, people laugh at me when I say the catastrophic events aren't always as catastrophic as you feel, and sometimes the insurance is the catastrophe, right? So fast forward now, Keith Smith is invited to Florida uh, by the governor's office of Florida. They're holding a commission on hospital and healthcare costs, and Keith flies in, and he's testifying before the commission, and he said, I really appreciate you inviting me to Florida from Oklahoma City, but there's this guy up the road, <laughs> and he, of course, he mentions me by name, um, and of course, the governor's office, which happened to be Rick Scott <laughs> at the time, uh, sent his team and invited me to testify. Uh, and the person listening to that testimony happened to be the, the CEO of one DeSoto Memorial Hospital, which you see down there at the bottom. DeSoto Memorial Hospital is a 49-bed rural hospital in the second poorest county in the state of Florida. 
not a big hospital, um, not a very wealthy population by any means stretch of the imagination. But he, but he listened to that and he said, he called me up out of the blue. I'd never met him before. My main office is an hour from this hospital. And he said, Dr. Gross, we would love to work with you kind of like Oklahoma surgery. We'd love to give you some, some bundled prices. Let's see if we can work together on your uninsured patients. And we sat down and we crafted surgical bundles and essentially started a medical tourism program in the state of Florida. You know, there are some things that can't be done in an ambulatory surgery center that need to be done in a hospital. Uh, so we, it was nice that we had that option. So if you are very savvy, uh, you're a self-pay patient in, in the United States, you could go down to an HCA hospital. They're going to charge you about $120,000 to $150,000 for your knee replacement surgery. If you're really good, you might be able to negotiate that down to between forty-five dollars to $70,000 if you're really good. You could do medical tourism and fly to Singapore for eighteen dollars to $22,500, or you could fly to Florida and have this done at the Soto Memorial Hospital for $18,550, including the inpatient rehab today. So again, we built an entire cash network. We've wor worked on how to deal with some catastrophic stuff or affordable things. And the question was, how, can't we build a health plan around this? I've certainly heard Jay Kempton tell his story enough. I tried to convince Jay to come to Florida at the time. He was not interested in coming to Florida at the time. Uh, and so I uh, was talking with the CEO of the hospital about their health plan. The hospital was self-insured. They were already a self-insured health plan but they were self-insured with a commercial TPA, commercial third-party administrator, to administer their claims. Uh, and I convinced them to entertain Carl Schussler to come on down uh, and make that presentation. So the picture on the left is Carl Schussler. Carl Schussler he's a, a benefits advisor from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and a couple notable things on this picture. First of all, the picture on the left, Carl is not wearing pink pants. This will be the only photo you will not see Carl wearing pink pants. And I can say that because he's not here to defend himself. Um, and on the right hand side is the cost of an employee health plan that we built around direct primary care. And it's very, very blurry, but that top line, what you're going to see is the employee's contribution for that plan is $40 per pay period or $80 a month. Uh, and that includes the direct primary care membership. That's the employee's contribution. And that was when we launched in 2019. That price has not changed today it's to the penny. Exactly the same. We have not raised prices in five years to our, to the employees of this hospital. And they built that plan around us. Uh, so why would I break free from insurance and then start taking and contracting with a, a 200 and some employee health plan? Uh, because they built it around us. And the prior authorization requirements were Dr. Gross recommended. What's the prior authorization for an MRI? Dr. Gross said he needed an MRI. What's the prior authorization for a referral? Dr. Gross said he needed a referral. That was, that was the process. They eliminated everything. Well, what, what podiatrists do you like? What cardiologists do you like? Fine. We'll build them into the plan. They're automatically approved. If you refer them, it's automatically built into the plan. We don't have to pick up a phone. We don't have to fight. We don't have to do anything. So that's why we do that. So fast forward and now here's our data thing. So what we have is we have two data options uh, for this plan. We have before we got into there, so self-insured 2018 and before, and then self-insured through an independent third-party administrator and then they have within that plan free choice to choose direct primary care and not direct primary care. We gave them options. If they chose the direct primary care side, they gave them an incentive by reducing their premiums by 20%. We wanted to make it easy for them to make the right decisions. And by the way, if I referred them anywhere, anything that was done in the hospital was free to them. Any surgeries, any imaging services, any laboratory services, anything done in the hospital was completely free. So no co-pays for primary care, no pays for services uh, that were referred out of our office to the hospital. And just in 2021 alone, I could say we launched in 2019, 2021 alone, between the direct primary care and the not direct primary care side, uh, we saw actually a 46% improvement in the direct primary care side for the amount that was paid by the plan itself. So that's kind of comparing standard fee for service versus this. But if you actually compare the whole plan itself for, for the DPC side and the non DPC side, they both outperform the national benchmarks for a PPO for a group this size. By the DPC blew them away at 60%, but the national benchmarks beat by 27% on the non-DPC side. So they, the plan itself outperformed, but the DPC sort of stole the show. So if you look here um, at that top line, the, the amount paid by the plan, this is a three-year average now. So anybody can have one good year, cherry pick one good year. Now we're looking at a three-year average from the time we started the first three years, and we'd saved almost 40% on the direct primary care side. So 40% savings for DPC versus the non-DPC. The total out-of-pocket saved by the patients were 30%. Now, I said I have more time. I sort of showed you that pretty little slide of cool $300 thing. 
you know, I can prevent the ER visits, but can I put my money where my mouth is? And can I really show reduction in emergency room visits? We had a 40% reduction in ER visits on the direct primary care side compared to the non. I said, I have more time. I can manage more stuff in house. You know, I don't send this patient to the dermatologist, right? So I should be able to show that in, in downstream savings of specialist spend, 30% cheaper on the, on the specialist spend on the direct primary care side. Now you'd say, yeah, but you pre-funded the primary care. That's cheating. You got your thumb on the scale, right? Um, so if you, if you built in the primary care costs, then it actually gets more expensive. Well, actually, no, it was the opposite. The thing about fee-for-service primary care is they're very efficient at extracting a fee-for-service. Every level three visit should become a level four visit. Every four should become a level five. The, the, the electronic health register, health, I don't call it a register. Electronic health record is a cash register and the patient is an ATM to extract money from the insurance company, which is in this case, the employer, which in case is taking money out of the employee's pockets. Uh, so the, it was actually more expensive for the primary care on the fee for service side than prepaying for it on the direct primary care side in this series of patients. Say, so, well, the reason you were cheaper is you had a healthier population. You know, you cherry picked the, 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 the easy people, but all the sick people, they wanted to stay with their doctor, right? Actually, we had 21% more chronic disease in the direct primary care group, so we had a sicker population. And when you compare them to the national benchmarks, we had actually more patients that are with chronic disease than the national benchmarks for a similar patient size. We had more cancer, we had more coronary disease, we had more endocrine diseases. So this was not a healthy uh, population by any stretch of the imagination that we saw these savings in. So if you look at these savings now, on the diabetes side, the direct primary care side, we were managing diabetes for 82% less than the national benchmarks for managing diabetes. How is that possible that you could be 82% less than the national average? Well, it takes three minutes to write a prescription that costs $1,000 a month, but it takes 30 minutes to not write a prescription that costs $1,000 a month. With frequent touches, frequent repeats, bringing the patient back in the office, frequent uh, follow-ups, frequent phone calls, constant reinforcement. It's a lot of work to keep somebody off a of medication that will cost this plan $12,000 a year with multiple patients. So it also takes a lot of work and effort to get these patients off of polypharmacy. Uh, we have the time to do that. So we're seeing savings across the board. I already talked about dermatology. We won't beat the dermatologist up because it's, it's not a warfare against the derms. So one of the ways that we we're able to see some of these savings is you look at, we talked about steerage over the last couple of days. So if you look at the direct primary care side, if you look at the numbers in the blue, those are domestic spend. That's money spent by the hospital, the employer, to the hospital. The gray is, is foreign spend, the money spent by the hospital to somewhere else. So when we actually took over the plan, the majority of the money was spent by the hospital somewhere else. But when you came into the direct private care side, 85% of the hospital money was spent by the hospital to the hospital because we were steering the care to the hospital. Again, it was free to the employee. So we were able to structure it in a way we made them, got them to make the decisions that we wanted them to make. So again, while we showed savings, the hospital actually realized even bigger savings because it was out of the 85 cents spent, it was spent to the right pocket to the left pocket. The incremental cost of the hospital to add one more CBC or one more MRI is really nothing. Um, so it really doesn't cost them that much more to provide this extra care. So let's look at what happened during the pandemic. So in 2020, uh, 47 hospitals across the country closed. Most of them were rural hospitals. 70% uh, of physicians during that early stages of, of the uh, pandemic shut their doors or stopped in-person visits. But at DeSoto Memorial Hospital, we had a 28% year-over-year growth. So every time they had an open enrollment, we were seeing 28% more people signing up for the direct primary care. So our practice was growing while the other practices were shrinking and cutting off service. Again, we had that 20% reduction in employee premiums that we offered them initially. That was sustained, and to this day is still sustained. It's 20% cheaper for them. No premium increase, I already mentioned, in five years. And in year number two, the stop-loss carry our claims history was so low uh, that the, that the stop-loss had to lower our premiums in year number two. It allowed us, because we were doing so well and recruited so many folks from this plan, that we were able to bring in and recruit a full-time physician to take over to this DeSoto Memorial Hospital location. So we brought, brought in Dr. Tiffany Hubman as an associate physician. My partner, Dr. Crouch, and I handed it off to her. And we, uh, we went back to our main location in Northport, and she now manages, to this day, our DeSoto Memorial Hospital location. And, and she's an absolute treasure to our practice. The hospital also used those savings that we, that we acquired, which I'm going to talk about, to hire the first full-time general surgeon in the history of the county. 
So reinvesting the resources and savings back into the community to provide services for the community. So Hurricane Ian hit, direct hit, um, and the entire community was cut off by floodwaters. What did we do? We contacted all of our patients, uh, if we could, by cell phone. We emailed every single patient, whoever we couldn't email. We reached by social media, uh, and we made sure that everyone that had anything they needed was, or didn't have anything needed was able to reach out to us. So we provided immediately to switch to telemedicine and online services from in-person services. And this is me and Dr. Bill Crouch at our main location in, in Northport uh, after Hurricane Ian. So my home had $150,000 in damages. My business had $250,000 in damages. We had no electricity for two weeks. The emergency room staffed by the not, ta not for tax hospital uh, next to my office was destroyed. So they closed. And how many days was our office closed? None. We opened up the next day. We opened up in our, on our porch in our parking lot. We took every comer. We did not require them to be patients of ours. We did sutures in our parking lot. Uh, we did nebulizers off of car batteries. We treated infants. We treated all comers. Uh, and we became the emergency room for the first 72 hours until the, until the national help could, could arrive in our community. So in 2019, everybody knows what an accountable care organization is. Uh, after five years of losses, the rural accountable care organizations finally showed a, a savings benefit of $64 per beneficiary. In our first year of working with the Seto Memorial Hospital, we saved $2,424 per beneficiary. It wasn't a fair fight. So when we took over the plan, the, the medical expense, and these numbers aren't critically important, but when we took it over, they were paying $13,852 per employee per year. The first year we took over, it went down to $4,500. The second year, it went to $5,500. Notice these prices are going up. Costs are going up. In year number three, we're at $7,300. So in year number three, we're still almost 50% lower than when we started. And that's assuming that that starting figure wouldn't have gone up 12 to 15% per year, okay? So a lot of people say, well, you strip down the plan you know, the reason that, that you can make it so cheap is because employees can't have access. You stripped out their networks. Uh, the, the, they must be very unhappy. They can't go anywhere. But I'm going to let Hannah tell you her story, and then I'm finished. Well, the benefits that we have here at the hospital are more so focused on the employees. Um, the latter part of August, I was had a concern regarding my neck and I went in to see my, my primary care, um, listened to my concerns, and he recommended certain protocols. It was my choice of what I wanted to do. You would think with the specialist, the appointments are so far out. Within maybe three weeks from seeing my primary care, um, having my test done, getting my results, finding out that I need to have a biopsy done. Biopsy comes back, positive for cancer on the left side, and a week later, I was headed into surgery. As of today, all is well. I have gone through the process and estimated cost of $42,000. What did I pay? Absolutely nothing. So before I was paying all that money on my premium and I never used the plan because I was reluctant. Because if I, okay, I have this copay, I'm gonna have this deductible. We don't have those issues. Every concern I've had since day one of this plan, I have addressed and have taken care of this year and I've paid absolutely nothing out of pocket and we deserve that I know I do thank you very much it's been a pleasure